On Animal Attractions TV, we've got questions. What should you look for when you're choosing a particular kitten? How can you help your new puppy in her first 24 hours at home with you? And can this be the same breed of dog? Well, we've got the answers and much more coming up next. This here's Baby. Isn't she just precious? Now one minute she's so independent and completely ignores me. And then just like that, all she wants is my attention. Now if you're planning on adding a lovely cat to your household, we think this segment's just for you. Now here's Roger Tabor, who's going to share with us some of what he's learned during his more than 30 years of studying and observing these wonderful creatures we call cats. Now today, it's all about how to get your pick of the litter. People often ask me, are breeds of cats really that different from each other? Well, only somebody who's never had a cat would ever ask that. Sure, if you've had dogs, you know there are Great Danes, you know there are Chihuahuas, and of course they're different. But cats, they're all about the same size, so how can they be that different? Well, all you have to do is just take a look at mystery here. With this full coat of the Persian and the heavy, ponderous way of looking at life, it's a much more of a sedate animal. And so when you get to terms with an animal like this, you soon understand its individual character. Don't you, Mr. Eh? <laughs> Persians need a lot of grooming. But if you don't have the time, then why not consider the exotic short hair? Same personality traits, but with shorter hair. Or maybe you prefer a more active breed, like the Siamese or the related Burmese. They've often been called the dog lovers cats because they're very playful and friendly like a puppy. The more you learn about various breeds, their personality traits and specific care needs, the better chance you have of making a good choice of the right feline breed for you. Well, it's one thing to have chosen your breed, but how do you now choose the individual? If you're going for something like this. Of course you're going for a purebred cat, but for most of us, we're going to go for a pet quality animal. Indeed, you might even go, as most people do, for the average Joe cat, as we would say in the UK, the moggy, you know, the one that's left to its own breeding devices. And then you're certainly talking about an individual cat. Of course, when you're selecting your cat, you want a healthy cat. And a good breeder and even a shelter will often have good health records. If there's no health record, have the cat inspected by your vet. Look for things like eyes. They should be bright and clear with no discharge. The nose, there should be no runniness there. The coat should be shiny and full with no patches. Look into the cat's mouth. Does it have pink gums, not white? Don't forget to look into the ears. Is there any discharge there? Avoid a grumpy kitten or a shy one sitting huddled by itself in a corner. You could have issues. And certainly, I'd avoid one that bites. Handle each one individually. The kitten should relax after a couple of minutes. If he's still tense, go on to another kitten. You're looking for a happy, frisky, playful kitten who purrs when around you. It's a sign that the kitten has been well socialized. If the kitten is relaxed and happy, then purring is a pretty good indicator that the kitten is responding very positively to you. It really is sensible to spend a lot of time trying to sort out what's the best match for a cat and yourself. But at the end of the day, and it doesn't matter how good an expert at cats you are, you go along, you look into that litter, and you look into the eyes of one cat, because that's exactly what I did, and I ended up with my present cat. We all do it. If I told you that the bite of one little mosquito could potentially kill your pet, would you believe it? Well, it's true. Mosquitoes can carry parasites that cause the disease heartworm. Heartworm disease is exactly what it sounds like. It's worms that live in the heart. These worms can sometimes reach a foot in length. 
This potentially fatal disease can affect cats and dogs alike. These worms are spread from one infected animal to another by the bite of a mosquito. After the mosquito bites, the larvae, or immature worms, are transmitted into the body of the new animal, where they eventually mature in the heart and lungs. Heartworm disease is a worldwide problem and has been reported in all 50 U.S. states. It can be found nearly anywhere that mosquitoes occur. Annual testing of dogs is very important to catch the disease early in the process. This involves a very simple blood test that your veterinarian can run for you. With both cats and dogs, signs may not be apparent until the disease is more advanced. Dogs may exhibit a mild persistent cough, weight loss, or reduced appetite. Cats have very nonspecific symptoms, and at worst, sudden death may occur without warning. Treatment for dogs is costly and involved, and for cats, there is no effective treatment. But there is hope. Prevention today is affordable and very effective. There are many options out there to fit you and your pet's lifestyle, including both oral and even topical treatments. A common misconception that cat owners have is that indoor-only cats don't need to be on a preventative. This is not true. 30% of diagnosed cases are in cats that have never been outside. So the next time you're in your veterinarian's office, don't just walk by this little heart model, but let it be a reminder to use heartworm preventative. It's one of the most important things you can do to protect your pet. Loyal, brave, trustworthy. It may sound like a Boy Scout motto, but actually these words describe this guy's breed, the German Shepherd. And there are many other qualities we can all appreciate, even aspire to, like devotion. Isn't that right, dude? Here, take a look. This breed was first recognized in 1899 as Shepherds in Germany. But in World War I, they were employed as messengers, rescue dogs, sentry dogs, and personal guard dogs. When the war was over, the word was out, and German Shepherds spread across the world. Instead of some of the breeds that were bred to do a single task, like hunting a specific type of prey, German Shepherds were bred for their versatility. That means that they have the beginning parts of a number of different behavior patterns, which it's then the trainer's job to shape into the appropriate adult behavior. And for German Shepherd puppies, that training starts as early as 10 weeks, because when it comes to learning, their brains are like sponges. They have so much curiosity and so much liveliness. They're constantly exploring and testing their environment. This also gets them into a lot of trouble in the household. However, it's the foundation of all of the wonderful things that we can train them to be in it as an adult. The bad rap shepherds get is that they're high strung, threatening with strangers, overly aggressive to other dogs, and impossible to dominate even by its owner. This makes training so essential with this breed because a well-adjusted German Shepherd can make the perfect canine companion. German Shepherds are the traditional seeing eye dogs. German Shepherds are very intelligent dogs. They're capable of sorting out the problems and dealing with uh, travel and unanticipated issues on the street or on the highways. This dog is with me all the time. Ursel and I go to work. She is accepted, but at the same time ignored as she should be as a part uh, of her role as a seeing eye dog. She really feels a sense of responsibility for me to make sure that I'm safe and not running into things or getting in trouble. If you think the German Shepherd is for you, it's critically important that you seek out a responsible breeder and then choose your puppy very carefully. But you should also be aware that the German Shepherd is prone to a few health problems. One of the major concerns that we would find would be um, something called hip dysplasia which is a hereditary disease that they can have. This is a degenerative joint disease where the, the ball and socket joint of the hip just doesn't come together very well and can cause some pretty bad lameness in these dogs where they just are not able to get up and get around and, and do things that normal dogs would do. German Shepherds as adults are large and active dogs and they do enjoy being outside, but people often send them to the backyard to live out there alone 
and unfortunately this leads only to behavior problems because generations and generations of selective breeding have gone into making the German Shepherd a breed that wants to work with human beings. So they need to be with you and if you're in the backyard then they want to be in the backyard. If you're in the house then they want to be in the house. So the German Shepherd, more than most, is a breed that needs careful and consistent bonding with its owner. It's a dog that needs to be useful, whether it's as a guide dog, a family protector, or even running an agility course. If you can provide that, if you have a job for a breed with both brains and heart, the German Shepherd may be the perfect companion for you. Animal Attractions TV, we're all about sharing information and expert advice to help you and your pet have a great life together, including what to do when everything seems to be going wrong, like in this next story. But not to worry, Coach Ronald White, our pet trainer 911, to the rescue. <laughs> Bentley is totally insane. He jumps on the furniture, he jumps on people, he chews up everything, he is loud, he's obnoxious. A lot of his behaviors are annoying, but some of them are actually dangerous. You know, he's gotten into prescription medicines and eaten the whole bottle, um, and we've had to call the veterinarian dozens of times. And he's also caused a fire in our kitchen before. He jumped up on the stove and turned it on when there was pizza up there and the pizza box caught on fire. I can't even go outside with my girlfriend Amber and have a cup of coffee in the morning without Bentley jumping on us. Ow! It's hot. Are you okay? Yeah. You believe that? We need to get him trained, honey. Okay, he's what, jumping around the house? Yeah, he jumps up on the furniture. He jumps up on people. Now, what about when he attacks the other dogs? Yeah, what happens is whenever Rocky wants to go outside, uh, Bentley waits out there, and when he tries to go outside, he bites his neck. Now, not playing. No. He's dominant. He wants to be the leader. I'm going to take your dog home for 30 days. OK. And then when I'm done training, I'm going to train you for seven. And you'll see when your dog comes back home, he'll be well trained. He won't be grabbing your other dogs, and he won't be starting fires in your house. Sounds good. Okay. Come on, let's go. Bye, Bentley. So when you got three male dogs, there's going to be a problem about dominance. Who's the boss? So that's what the one dog was doing. He was establishing his place with the other two. He's the boss. They didn't know that they was headed for a big problem as the dogs got older. Because then, when they get older, two and three years old, there ain't no plan. They just run around there just fighting each other. Come on, let's go, come on. Good boy. First, I knew the dog had to go through some obedience in order for him to learn the commands. Well, since he's never been trained, I trained him to walk on the side of me, to sit, down, stay. Sit, down, stay. Come here, come here. I go towards my furniture, and I won't say anything. I want to see if he's going to respect it. Come here, time out. Time out. That's his couch. Uh, once he has the basics down, I'll take him put food somewhere and he'll get up there and get it and I'll give him a little tug and I'll say the word, leave it. Leave it. I want him to know it just like he knows his name. So I won't use his name. And then I'll drop something in front of him and if he goes down to smell it, I'll give him a tug on his lead and tell him to leave it. Leave it. So I put him in different situations where he hear the word, leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. And once he learns that word, leave it, and he respects me, I knew that I had to uh, let him get along with the other dogs. You get the toy? Here, here. And so what I did, I took him out of the yard, I let the dogs that I had here in boot camp around him to play with him, but I'm the dominant dog then. I'm the leader of that pack that he's in. And if there's a scuffle going out there between two dogs, I'll just go out there and say, leave it. Hey, Wobber, leave it. Where I won't have to reach down there and get hurt. Did you see him bully him? Leave, hey, 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 what I tell you to? You leave it. You see, that's what you do at home, huh? You gotta get along. But when you go home, you'll stop messing with the other ones. That's a good boy, that's a good boy. Okay. When I seen that he was getting along with the other dogs, I knew that it was time for him to go home. 
I hope your owners do as well as you did. After we train a dog, we work on the owners. When Ronald first showed up, it took Stop. me uh, several Sit. minutes before I believed that it was even my dog. Stay. I stretch my lead out. He Make taught us all the commands that Bentley deal. now was able to follow, right. and he Stop. also showed Stop. us how to maintain the training so that Bentley wouldn't forget it. If you continue to tell him to have the command, he'll stay trained. He asked me about what one of my dream scenarios would be. Um, having a perfectly trained dog and I told Ronald that I'd like to be able to ride in my fishing kayak with the dogs and to my surprise he said he'd be able to train them to do that. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, come on. Good boy. Come on. That's a good boy. Bentley, good boy. Uh, never been swimming. He was nervous at first but then I built his confidence up. He came right into the water and it was fantastic. Come on, let's go out. Let's go. Good boy. That's a good boy. Come on, let's do it again. Come here. He's a swimmer. Come on, let's go out. I trained him how to get in the kayak and sit there while I, I moved through the boat, moved the boat. I think I'm going to get me one of these. Good then boy. I got out and I put him in the water, like in the huh? kayak, and moved him around the water. And he just stayed right there and he liked it. And I knew that he was ready to go. You got your obedience down. You're kayaking. Huh? Henry's going to be happy. You know that? At first, I was a little worried that Bentley wouldn't be able to ride in the kayak with me. I was afraid that he, uh, he might jump out into the water, so Stay. I was a little nervous. Stay. Stay. Keep saying it. Stay. After Ron spent, you know, a couple hours training him, it was amazing. Put him in the kayak, and he sat right there and took the ride. And I told Henry to try to do it every day with him if he could, or once a week, but take them kayak away, because now they have structure. Having a big dog is amazing. You know, we go outside and play fetch, and we go swimming. He's a great companion. You guys want to go ride in the kayak? But the most exciting thing for me was being able to go fishing in my kayak with Bentley as a sweet, loving dog. Life is good. Long hair or short hair breeds? Does one cost more than the other? Well, that depends how much time you have at home to spend grooming, like Kiara here. She has a medium coat, so that's gonna take at least weekly brushing to keep it healthy and unmatted. But if you plan to have a professional do it, here are some costs you might wanna consider before making the commitment. Most short hair dogs will require minimal grooming. Many can have their grooming needs taken care of at home, if you choose to take your short haired dog to the groomers, you will typically only have to pay for bathing, ear cleaning, and nail trimming. Some dog salons even have a do-it-yourself area. For a minimal price, you can bring your easy-to-groom dog and be provided with a pet-friendly sink, shampoo, towels, and more. However, if you own a dog that has long, thick hair, or one that requires a complicated cut, you need to anticipate a higher monthly cost for dog grooming. Small breeds can cost upwards of $30 for each grooming session. Medium to large dogs can cost $50 and up. Grooming is important to keep a long-haired dog's coat from being matted, dirty, or too long and thick. Think about it. If you have a medium-sized dog that requires a trip to the groomers every month at the low cost of $50 a trip, over 10 years, you'll spend $6,000 on haircuts for your pet. So it's important to figure out how much your pet's gonna cost you before you decide on a pet. But as many long hair breed owners like to say, they're very well worth it. Are you one of the millions of people expecting a new member of the family? The furry kind with four paws and a face that melts your heart? In other words, are you getting a puppy? Well, we're here to help with a series of tips and techniques to guide you both through your puppy's first 12 months. So, you've successfully prepared and secured your home, you've purchased your supplies, equipment, and toys, and after all your research, you've made what you know is the right choice. And now's when the real fun begins, bringing your puppy home. What a special day. 
But your puppy is not the only thing you'll need to pick up. You need to get his paperwork also, his health and shot records, because his veterinarian will need to see those. And there's one more thing that you need to get, and this is going to sound a little strange, but bear with me because you'll be very happy that you did. To get an early start on his housebreaking, bring a sample of his urine smell. If he's been using disposable pads, ask if you can cut off a piece that has a sample on it. Or you can simply rub a paper towel or a napkin over a place where you know he's gone. Then put it in a plastic bag and bring it home with you. And now for the more pleasant aspects of bringing your new puppy home. Put on his new little collar and then for safety while driving, place him inside a sturdy carrier for his ride home. Oh, and be sure to not have his leash on. That way he won't get tangled up or choke himself or he won't try to eat it. You can thread the seatbelt through the handles of most carriers to secure it in case you have to make a quick stop. Ah, uh, home sweet home. But wait, don't head inside just yet. First things first, take your puppy straight to his new bathroom spot. Take out the plastic bag you brought from his old home and put the scent cue you collected on the ground, right where you want him to go, and say, hurry up. If he goes, praise him. And if he doesn't, bring him back to that spot every 10 or 15 minutes and repeat the drill until the mission is accomplished. Arrival day is a wonderful day. It's a cause for celebration. But to help keep it as soothing as possible, try to keep a low-key atmosphere and limit introductions to family members only on the first day. When meeting the rest of the family, introduce people and puppy one at a time and in a calm manner. Teach him that a good greeting is a calm greeting. Be sure to not coddle him during this process. You want him to be confident in his environment, and to accomplish this, let him be a dog. Smell things, explore things. That is, as long as he's at the end of a long leash that's attached to you. Dogs and puppies can dehydrate quickly, so show him his water bowl and encourage him to drink. And when it's time to eat, be sure you've reviewed the instructions for the proper feeding times and amounts for your particular puppy. Active puppies need a lot of sleep, so after a little exploration, he may want to take a nap. Put him in his little crate with a soft bedding, be sure to remove his leash, and remember to put in one of your socks that you've recently worn so he will have your scent with him while he naps. Check on him every 10 minutes, and as soon as he wakes up, be sure to take him out of the crate immediately for two reasons. The first reason is because you want to take him out before he cries. You don't want to wait till after he cries because then you've just taught him that whenever he fusses, you'll automatically take him out of the crate. So take him out before he starts crying for attention. And reason number two, so he can get to the hurry up spot and go on cue. Bedtime is often the most difficult time for a new puppy because it's the first night that he's been away from his mother and litter mates, and here's the least traumatic way to deal with it. Dogs are pack animals, and one of the quickest ways to spend bonding time as a pack is to sleep in the same den. Not in the same bed, but the same den, as in room. You have your bed, and the puppy gets his crate with his soft bedding. Remember to keep your worn sock in there to reassure him with your scent. You can place a towel over the back end so that his view is funneled towards you. And if he cries, you can hang your hand over the bed so he can see and smell it. If he cries constantly, ignore it. Do not get him out of the crate and put him in the bed with you, unless you want to create problems later. However, if he cries in a few hours or is still crying in a few hours, it's a good idea to take him out for a hurry up break in his bathroom spot. <laughs> Soon the morning will arrive and you will have gotten through your first 24 hours with your new puppy. Now all that's left to do is to be patient, consistent, and before you know it, these little puppy kisses will turn into full-fledged doggy licks. You're just the cutest little thing. <laughs> You're such a cutie. Now if you like me, you love your pet a whole lot then you're probably guilty of buying a bunch of pricey treats and then giving your dog a little bit more than they need. But what if you can save some money and make homemade treats at a fraction of the cost? I'm gonna show you how. First, you take about two cups of your dog's regular dry food, put it in the blender, and grind it up. And then, you pour it into a mixing bowl like this. 
And you're gonna take about a cup of water or just enough to make it pasty and slowly add it in and stir it. Well, it looks like paste or you can call it muddy. Then you can take this and treat it like you would do little Christmas cookies. I like to shape mine into little hearts and stars. So you take your little mixing spoon and you flatten it out like you would do Christmas cookies. And you keep doing that until you've used up all of your little dog food. Here's another star. And if you use a non-sticking uh, cooking pan, it really works because then you won't have to worry about trying to peel away the excess cookie paste. Now once your tray is complete, place your cookies in the oven on 350 degrees for about no more than a half an hour or until yours become crispy. Ah, perfect. Whew. Now once your treats have cooled off and you've given a couple to your pet, you can store them in your refrigerator for up to a week before you should discard them but never try to store them in the freezer. Believe me, I've tried and it does not work. Here's another tip. Treats should never replace your dog's meal. In fact, treats should only be about 10% of your dog's daily intake to make for a balanced diet. And voila, you've saved some money and your pet's happy too. I think somebody wants a little treat. Well, let's see. I think it's cool. Okay. Now for more tips like these, just log on to our website at AnimalAttractionsTV.com. Now from all of us here at Animal Attractions TV, we'll see you next time. I gotta run, I think somebody wants another treat. Let's try a star. Okay.